Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Man, you need to know this scripture. What does it say? If any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation. Old things have passed away and what? All things have become new. And so what he's telling us here is that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the old way of living is gone. The old way of thinking is gone. The old way of seeing is gone. The old way of praying is gone. The old way of receiving is gone. I mean, everything about that life that was B.C., it's gone, and everything has changed. And because things have changed, we have to figure out what the changes have been so that we can grab a hold of those changes and actually start seeing some success and some results. Uh, the sad thing that happens is, is that so many times we lead people to the cross and people understand what Jesus did on the cross. He died for their sins. But what happens is, is that we, we go to the cross and we stay there at the cross because we have this understanding that, you know, Jesus, he died for us, substitution. And he, he took our, our sins for us. But, but then so many of us, we stay right there. And, and for the rest of our life on this planet, we're standing right there looking at the cross, looking at our sins, looking at our shame, and we just stay there and, and nothing ever changes. Brother Hagin made this statement long ago. He said, uh, too many times we take people to the cross. We're real good at that. But what we need to do then is we need to take them on to Pentecost. And he said, then don't take them to Pentecost and leave them there. Take them from, the, from Pentecost and take them to the throne. Why? Because there's a progression there and where, yes, I understand Jesus died for me, uh, substitution, and yet I identify myself with that. And then because of his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, I, could, I could become in Christ, and now the baptism of the Holy Spirit becomes available to me. And so I grab a hold of that, and then I'm supposed to go from there, and I'm supposed to be living from the throne of God. Ephesians 2 says that we were raised up and made to sit down together with Christ in heavenly places. So we ought to go from the cross and, and, and go all the way in that progression where we're learning to live like a king. We're more than conquerors that we're always being led in triumph in Christ, that we're winning in everything, every situation in life. That's where we're supposed to be. And that's what we're endeavoring to, to help you to do is to help you win in every single area and facet of your life. So there is a new way of living, and that uh, salvation is not just your golden willy wonka ticket to heaven. There's more to salvation than just going to heaven. Uh, salvation was not just about changing your destination. Salvation was about changing what? Your position, your position, and, and putting you in the position of being where? In Christ. If any man be where? In Christ. Everything is brand new. Everything changes. Jesus does not save you just to help you a little bit. You didn't get saved, and Jesus looked at you and said, I hope I'll help you a little bit. No, he came to change everything, absolutely everything. And so one scripture we've been keying in on the last few weeks is Philemon. Chapter 1, verse 6. There's only one chapter there. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6. And it says this. He said, I pray that, that the sharing of your faith would be effective and it would be powerful by the acknowledgement of every good thing that's in you because of your identification with Christ. He said, I pray that your faith and your life would be powerful and effective. How? By acknowledging, by, by having a good understanding, a good knowledge of every good thing that's in you because of your identification with Christ. So what does it mean? What does identification mean? What does that mean? To identify, it means to view or treat as the same. It means to view, to view or treat as identical. Identical. So he's talking about the fact that you and I, uh, we are identical with Christ. And, and what Christ did was he came to, to change things and get us back to the original position that God had planned for you and I. And you can see it with Adam in the very, very beginning. And we know because of Adam's sin, his mess up, things changed. But thank God, Jesus, he was a second Adam, and he came and he fixed it. And he got us back into that position where we became one with God. So Philemon 1, 6, what is it? I pray your faith would be effective and powerful. Your life would be effective and powerful by acknowledging, by having a good, accurate knowledge and understanding of every good thing that's in you because of your identification with Christ. So we need to understand the good things that happen to us, uh, the good things that happen for us, the good things that are happening through us because of our union 
and our identity with Christ. And so last week, I mentioned to you that, you know, it would do every single one of us good, and I do this all the time, to go through the New Testament, especially uh, the, what's called the epistles, uh, the letters to the church, you know, uh, Romans, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, all of those, because in there, you'll find some scriptures that have this phrase, in Christ, in him, in whom, through him, those type of scriptures, because those are the scriptures, those are, those are the building blocks for you and I. And it's, those are the building blocks, and that's the foundation for you and I in which we build a, a good, successful, godly marriage, that we have good, successful, godly, healthy bodies, good, successful, uh, healthy finances and relationships, how, how you and I, we access the, the realm of the supernatural, and we, and we allow God to move through us. And it's not going to be because of, of this out here and, and how smart I am and, and how much I've accomplished out here. It's going to be because of everything that Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, we pointed out um, over there in uh, Philippians chapter 3. And Paul said this, after 30 years of ministry, Paul said this. He said, my aim is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. See, Paul understood that even after 30 years, there were some important things in there through what happened through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that, that affected you and I. And it was going to be important for us to understand those things. And so I'm telling you, these in Christ scriptures, they are phenomenal. They will change your life. If you don't know how to study your Bible, I would tell you this. Open up your Bible. Go to those books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all those, and go through and find every scripture that has the phrase in Christ, in him, through him, underline those circle those write them down on a, on a notepad i actually went through and you know those little uh, spiral index cards i got a little spiral index card years ago and i went through and i wrote down every in christ scripture that i could find so that i had them with me and this was before you know we had our phones and we could just flip through stuff so that i had them with me and when i was bored i'd pull them out and i'd just go through them and read them and read them and read them why because it was telling me who i was it was telling me who I was. And, and so that's why I can't look in the mirror to tell me who I am. You can't look in the mirror to tell you who you are. You can't look at your mom and daddy, you know, on the birth certificate to tell you who you are. You need to, to open up your Bible and look in that mirror and, and let those in Christ scriptures tell you who you are. And you talk about lighting yourself on fire. I was talking to a gentleman the other day. He, he messaged me on Facebook and he said, man, I'm just struggling. I'm trying to do everything right, and it just seems like I'm failing, you know. And I said, man, if you're trying to do everything right and you're failing, it's because you're doing it from the wrong position. And that's where a lot of Christians are. They're frustrated, they're tired, they're stressed out, and they're just failing and failing and failing. And every time they're trying to do right, they end up doing wrong, and it's just a struggle. But see, guys, God did not mean to save you so you could try to save yourself. He did not, he did not save you so you could try to change yourself. If you'll just understand who you are and begin to see yourself as Christ, that as he is, so are you. As you begin to see that, and that becomes your, your thought process, that becomes your perspective, what happens is, is as, as you begin to see yourself as him, your actions, your behavior, your character, your decisions, they will automatically line up with him. They'll be like him. If you want to be like him, just think like him. Don't try to do like him, just think like him. And all of a sudden, you'll find yourself acting like him and getting results like him. And so what, what I want to do today is just very simple, but you're going to have to have your Bible. And we're going to go through some of these, these in Christ scriptures. But what I did do, just to be nice, if you have your phone or you, and, and you've downloaded uh, the, the app that we have, our Train Church app, if you'll open that up, some of the scriptures that we're going to go through, or actually all the scriptures we're going to go through, we've already got them listed in there. So you've got them with you. And you can open up and look at, look at them at any time. So if you would, uh, if you have a Bible, turn over to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. This has been a scripture that really just jumped out at me years ago. And it's really the thing that's just kind of driven me and pushed me uh, and helped me start seeing some, some differences uh, as to why that there were successes in some people's lives and, and, and not in others. And Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Paul says this, he says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, 
Now I want you to walk in him. Notice he said, as you have received him, now walk in him. Now that first phrase right there, as you have received him, every Christian on the planet, that's them. Every single one of you in here, if you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you have received Christ. You've received him. But Paul's saying, now that you've received him, there's another step. There's another piece to the puzzle. Now you need to start walking in him. You need to walk in him. Uh, Acts 17, uh, verse 28 says what? You should know this one too. In him we what? We live, and in him we move, and in him we have what? Our being. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, this is another good one. It says, it's no longer I who lives, but it's what? It's Christ who lives where? In me, for the life that I live in this flesh, this mortal body, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith where? In the Son of God. So this life that I'm living on the planet, I'm living it like it's Christ living through me because it actually is. So Paul said, as you've received him, now you need to learn to walk in him. You need to learn to walk in him. And he tells you the reason why here. Verse 7, he said, I want you to be rooted and I want you to be built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Why? Because when you get rooted and you get built up in Christ and who you are, then what he's going to tell you in verse 8 will not happen to you. If you know who you are, because he said, I want you to watch out, beware, so that no one cheats you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, those of you like me that you grew up in church, we can all attest. Man, there's a lot of tradition, a lot of man-made principles, a lot of man-made this and man-made that. I remember when I was growing up, it was just kind of this said thing that, you know, if you didn't have your suit and tie on, God couldn't move. Yeah. I remember when I was... Uh, well, when Lacey and I, we, we, we were pastoring in Texas. I mean, the first couple of years, man, I mean, I, I felt like if I didn't come in my three-piece suit, my vest, my tie, my cufflinks, my bling bling, if I showed up, the anointing wasn't going to be there. Why? Because that's what I'd been told. It was the understood thing. And, you know, for, for those of you that has kind of grown up in church and seen things, and, and maybe some of you that are musicians, I mean, it was the same thing. If you didn't have your hanky when you were singing, man, the anointing wasn't going to be there. If you didn't wear your big hat to church, you were being disrespectful to the Lord. If you didn't wear your, your best. I mean, isn't it sad that, I mean, we still get this today. I have people that, that they'll call or message and, and say that, you know, they've never been to church or they're wanting to go to church and, and they were wanting to come and visit but wanting to make sure that, you know, they were wanting to know what the dress code was. Oh, my goodness. The dress code, just wear some clothes. Oh, I mean, if all you got is a bathing suit, or you wear that in a towel, I mean, just cover, cover the crucial things up, come to church. We don't care what you're wearing. As long as we don't see your stuff, I'm good. You know? But, I mean, look how far, we, all the junk that we've had to deal with, you know? And, and even ministers within my circles, I mean, you know, if they don't have the right music, they don't have special this and that. If they don't have the choirs, if they don't have the organ, I mean, it's like uh, nothing spectacular can happen. We, get, we have to have certain things. But that's not what it's about at all. It's about your position in Christ. It's about having a faith in your position, not faith in all your stuff. Not faith in all your stuff. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who he lives in me. He said, receive me. He said, don't let this stuff, the traditions and the, and the principles of where? The world, the world's principles, the way the world tells you the way things are. He said, don't let those things do what? Don't let them cheat you out of what Christ already did for you. Don't let them cheat you out of the things that Christ already did for you. So how do you keep yourself from being cheated? You get rooted in who you are in Christ. You get rooted and built up in who you are in Christ. I've had people tell me all the time, I don't understand why you talk so much about in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. This is why, because I don't want to see you cheated. I don't want to see you missing out on what Jesus already did for you. I don't want to see you get swept up with, with the current fads in Christianity as to how you do this and how you do that and how you receive this from God. And I don't want to see you working by the sweat of your brow to get what Jesus already got for you. I don't want you to be cheated. 
So you need to know who you are. And the problem is, is that everything out here is trying to tell you who you are. And yet everything out here, every single voice out here, they're all wrong. Because everything that's associated with this world cannot tell you who you are and, and what you truly have and what you can truly do. The only thing that can tell you that is the Word of God, and in particular, these in Christ scriptures telling you who you really are. If you want to see what you're like, look at Jesus. If you want to see what Jesus accomplished in you, you find these scriptures, some of these ones that we're going to go through that, that has that phrase, in Christ, in Him, through Him. You find those, it'll tell you who you are. And I'll tell you what, after you spend some time meditating on these things, you'll be looking for the S on your chest. And you'll be slapping a, a cape on your back. And you'll be putting on your little blue spandex, you know, I mean, because you're going to feel like you're something super. Because in all reality, you are. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you're no longer just human. You think about that one. You're no longer just human. You got a little bit of divine on the inside of you right now. Come on, 1 John 4, 4, greater is what? He, who's he? It's on the inside of you than he who's in the world. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. The mystery of the gospel is what? Christ in me. You're not just human anymore. You're extravagant. You're divine. You're supernatural. So look, turn over to Ephesians. We're just gonna, I'm a, we're gonna start with Ephesians chapter one, and we're gonna go through some of these. I'm certainly not gonna give you all of them. There's about 130 of them. Yeah, whoo. There's about 130 of them in there. And for me, there, there's, about, there's about 20 to 30 that are just, just really, really, really significant that I just really spend most of my time just meditating on and chewing on. But we're just gonna go through this first uh, two chapters in Ephesians. And you're going to have to read your Bible here. You might have to dust off a couple of pages. But you're going to get some reading in here today. But Ephesians chapter 1, and if you've never done this, hey, it's okay to write in your Bible. This isn't the paper that came down, you know, when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments or something. It's just plain old paper. All right, you can write in it, highlight in it. I mean, mine's falling apart. I've written in it so much. So underline, you've got to pin, underline, highlight these things. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Let's read this together. I'm reading now the New King James Version. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done what? He has blessed us. And what does it mean to bless? It means to empower, to prosper. He's, and notice this is past tense, right? That ED on the end means it's in the past. It's already been done, right? All right, so this isn't anything that you're trying to get, right? All right. He's blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing where? And heavenly places, how? In Christ. So in other words, what he's saying is that because of your position in Christ, everything heaven has to offer has already been given to you. Everything heaven has available, because of your position in Christ, God has already blessed you. He's already given it to you. So see, I'm not trying to get an open heaven. You hear some people talking about, you know, we're, we're, we're bombarding, we're praying, we're interceding, we're doing these things, you know, so we can have an open portal to heaven, whatever that means. Hey, I'm not trying, see, I'm, I'm not even operating according to, to the windows of heaven being opened up to me. I got the whole thing. See, you'll notice in our confession, when we make all our finances, it doesn't say that the windows of heaven will be opened up unto us. See, that's Old Testament. I don't have no window. I, I, I'm not going to be limited to a window. I got all of it. I got all of it. Now, I, 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 don't do, I don't do little. I don't want no little window. You can only squeeze so much through a window. You can open You can squeeze a whole lot more through a door. Knock down the wall, you can get a whole lot more in there. I mean, God, he removed all of the barriers, all the limitations, everything that heaven has of offer, it's yours. Because of your position in Christ. You could say it this way, that everything God wanted to get to you, he put in Christ. Everything he wanted in you, he put in Christ. Why? Because if he put it in Christ, and then you got in Christ, that means everything he put in Christ, it's yours. So don't, don't ever think that you're poor anymore. Don't ever talk poor. Don't ever think poor. I'm telling you, you are rich 
be on your wildest dreams. You don't need to have a rich uncle or a rich auntie or a rich grandma and grandpa. You've got a rich daddy. And everything heaven has available, it's yours. Notice he said not just some of it. He said every. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And, and think about this. This is a smart group this morning. All right? Every spiritual blessing. Where did physical things come from? The spiritual realm. So everything that made this what you can see, that's been made available to you. Every spiritual blessing in heaven places. So that's a part of, of Jake and I, our, our confession. I've been making him learn these scriptures. And if he can learn them at eight years old, you can learn them too. I was so proud of my little boy the other night. I, he, I'll quiz him every once in a while. I give him pop quizzes, you know. And he walked by the other day. And I said, Jake, real quick, two in Christ scriptures. And he goes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have everything heaven has to offer in Christ. It's like, good boy, get a piece of candy. You know? Man, I quiz him. And then I was so proud of him. He goes, oh, Daddy, give me another one. And he goes, oh, wait, I've got a confession sheet. Eight years old. He runs to his room. He comes back, and he had written down some scriptures. We had, at some point, we had talked about them, and he had written them down, and he had like three or four on there that he was learning. So I got him up to five now. And we're increasing one every couple of weeks, making him learn some more. And this is one of them. And so we just shortened it and condensed it and said, in Christ I have everything heaven has to offer. So this is one of them for you. So in Christ I have everything uh, heaven has to offer. And then if you go down uh, to verse 6, this is another good in Christ scripture. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Notice that last, that last phrase. He, he says, he made us, past tense, accepted where? In the beloved, in Christ. In Christ. So when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't ever think that you've got to work to get good enough for God to accept you. Because it wasn't about him accepting you. It was about him accepting Christ. And yet when you got in Christ, you were accepted too. So you could say it this way, the exact same way that God sees Jesus is the exact same way he sees you. And for some of us, that takes some thinking. Because for some of us, we did some rotten, dirty things in our life. For some of us, we did some rotten, dirty things this morning all the way to church. For some of us, we did some stuff out in the foyer right before we walked in. But some of you walked in and you saw something you didn't like and a thought came, you did it right there in your chair. But I'm telling you, the way God sees Jesus is the way he sees you because the blood of Jesus is greater than any mistake, any sin, any failure, any mishap. Anything you could do, the blood of Jesus is greater. The blood of Jesus is greater. So don't you ever doubt your self-worth in the eyes of God. Don't you ever doubt the way that God sees you. If you begin to feel condemned, if you begin to feel like you're not good enough, you need to take a step back and you need to look at Jesus and think about Jesus. And the, the way that you see Jesus, realize that's the way that God sees you because you are in him. You are in him. Say it with me. I'm in Christ. And the way God sees Jesus is the way God sees me. The way